Unraveling the Mystery of the Geochemistry of the Oregon Caves and Geology News. Welcome to Geology Talk, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts, brought to you by the Geological Society of the Oregon Country with assistance from the Portland State Department of Geology and the Beverly Vote Scholarship Fund. Our panelists today, Andrew Dunning, Emma Rahalski, Kerry Gordon, and myself, with technical assistance, as always, from Gary Joe Quinn in the background there. Thank you, Gary. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it off to Andrew Dunning and the Geology News. Uh, it's been an interesting summer so far. I've got a little bit of stuff in here from both July and August, but hopefully this shouldn't take too long. Start off with earthquakes. Biggest event of the last two months was a magnitude 7.2 south of the Aleutian Islands off of Alaska here. That's a subduction zone earthquake, and it actually generated a 15-centimeter tsunami that was observed on some of the nearby islands. There was also a magnitude 7.6 south of Tonga down here, which is a deep focus earthquake 200 kilometers deep, which is quite deep. Uh, wasn't really felt by anybody. Another deep focus earthquake in the last two months was this 6.6 .6 in uh, sort of right on the border between Argentina and Chile. Uh, it was felt on the surface by a few people, but no significant damage has been reported from that. Same cannot be said for a magnitude 6.3 in central Colombia. It was also felt in Bogota. There are two fatalities. About 50 people were injured and about 400 buildings have been damaged. Uh, the recovery from that is ongoing and based on the news I've seen, uh, going well. So all the best to those in central Colombia. Here in the United States, the biggest event was a magnitude 5.1 near Ojai in Southern California. This is Ventura County, August 20th. It coincided with, but was not at all related to the tropical storm that impacted the greater Los Angeles area. Interestingly, it did occur on a previously unmapped fault. So on an area that we didn't know uh, was capable of generating earthquakes, which is always interesting. Also big in the U.S. was a magnitude 4.5 here outside of Austin, Nevada, and a 4.1 outside of Trinidad, Colorado, right on the border between Colorado and New Mexico. There was actually another one in this same location just this morning, about the same size also, so that's interesting. Not much going on up here in the Northwest. There was a magnitude 2 just outside of, uh, just below Vancouver Lake, outside of Portland and Vancouver, if you know where that is. Uh, otherwise, a pretty unremarkable month in U.S. And, and Drew, there was there was a four point five off the coast of Oregon a couple of days ago. I, yes, I, yes, there was. Uh, I tried. I generally don't include those just because those happen every month, and if I always included them, it would be, I think, tiresome. And it also upsets my uh, my map view here. But yeah, those uh, Blanco fractures on earthquakes are happening all the time. It's one of the more seismically active areas in 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 the. Uh, in the U.S. In an interesting uh, little period for volcanic activity around the world, there are 27 ongoing or new eruptions, according to uh, both VolcanoDiscovery.com and the uh, Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program, which is a wonderful institution. There was substantial activity at Fagradasfjall in Iceland. This is the same area as there were uh, eruptions in 2021 and 2022. This is a view from the Iceland Meteorology Office's helicopter of the fissure that opened up and spilled out lava just to the north of those previously existing uh, lava flows. Over in Alaska, Shishaldin, which is in one of the Aleutian Islands right here off of uh, uh, southwest of Alaska, there have been a number of uh, ash explosion eruptions just like this one that have been interrupting flight paths over the last month or two. Um, there were two more this morning while I was asleep. Uh, all of them generally look like this. Uh, this volcano had been quiet for a long time, but over the last two months it's been uh, erupting quite frequently. And also down in Ecuador, Songhai is the or Songhai is the most active volcano in Ecuador. It's right about in the middle of the country, right here, and uh, it's been sort of continuously erupting since about 2021. But recently, the last two months, 
it's been averaging five to 700 individual detectable explosions per day, uh, which is really, <laughs> it's really cool. That's a lot of explosions coming up from the volcanic vent there. Sadly, there have been some disasters in the sort of Southeast Asia area. Uh, this summer's monsoon season has been particularly brutal in the Himalayan foothills in India, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, Myanmar in particular. Uh, the biggest one I've read about was in uh, Ishwaldi, India. There was a slope failure above a village that destroyed about two-thirds of the town here uh, and killed 84 people and displaced about 400. Um, so that's very... Very distressing, very sad, and a bunch of other landslides around the region have killed anywhere between 1 and 20 people. Um, I found about a half a dozen individual ones, but just mentioning the biggest ones, otherwise I'd be sitting here talking about fatal landslides all day, and I don't want to do that. That's all I've got for active geology. Let's move on to some cool research I've read about. There is a new numerical computational modeling study that was modeling the rate of ascent for magma to drive, uh, you know, what's the driving force behind volcanic eruptions. Um, and it's usually thought that water is one of the primary drivers of eruptions, and that is true in certain settings, like here in the Northwest or any other magmatic arc, where volcanoes are being fed by the subducting ocean plate that causes melting and causes volcanoes. That magma has a lot of water in it. But that's not the case for volcanoes that derive their magma from hot spots. So generally, water drives eruptions in certain volcanic settings, but the new geochemistry and numerical modeling work on hotspot volcanoes is showing otherwise. So an intraplate basaltic volcano, that's a volcano happening in the middle of a tectonic plate away from any plate boundaries, uh, they get their magma directly from the lower mantle. Some of them get their uh, magma from even deeper than that, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and using uh, lava from the 2021 volcanic eruption in the Canary Islands on La Palma, um, their geochemical work showed that CO2 is a far larger driving force of magma ascent and eruption force than water. So basically, as the magma rises and sits in the crust, um, the higher it rises, the lower pressure is on the magma and CO2 bubbles exhaled from the magma and expand, which pushes the magma upward. And that's how you get explosive basaltic eruptions in the middle of a tectonic plate. So very interesting work here. Understanding how magma is stored in the crust, um, which is basically one of the major implications of this research, helps us understand how these eruptions uh, evolve and which helps us understand how, like whether or not they could get bigger or smaller, how long they could last. Uh, and that helps us prepare and plan for volcanic hazards. So Andrew? Yeah. Before, oh, whoa, Martian mud. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I just saw your next header. Quick question on the, on the CO2. So that could be part of the explanation for old, the vol volcanism in the middle of the Colorado Plateau at round Flagstaff or, you know, I mean, I'm starting to see some other places where it's always questioned, why did we have eruptions there? Or, or diamond, diamond craters, Jordan craters down here in, in Southeast Oregon. Yeah. You know, that, uh -huh. that kind of, kind of makes things, it's a good puzzle, but thank you. This is cool research. Yeah. I think the Rio Grande, uh, rift, the Colorado Plateau volcanoes, um, that's going to be decompression melting. So that's compositionally different than uh, okay. these sort of hotspot volcanoes. Um, well, this is CO2. curious. Yeah, that's curious. Now I'm thinking about that. I'll think about that on my own time, though. <laughs> Move on to Martian mud cracks. Curiosity rover on Mars, one of our two robot geologists rolling around up there, found and analyzed a large slab of preserved polygonal mud cracks. This very much looks like a picture I could go out and take right now out in the desert somewhere in a dry lake. Uh, these are called desiccation cracks, so they form as mud dries and contracts as the water leaves it. 
Uh, usually, you know, the first time a mud puddle dries, you don't get these kind of polygons. Usually you get sort of right angle T-shaped fractures. And these polygons are the result of repeated wetting and drying. So a big, uh, one of the primary models for Martian water is that some kind of cataclysm uh, either warmed the climate or imparted a lot of water to the Martian atmosphere. Whatever it was, the water was there for a short time and then it was gone. Uh, but these kinds of polygonal mud cracks, which have been found elsewhere, this is just one of the best examples they've found, uh, suggests that uh, dry lake beds like this were repeatedly wet and dry over a long period of time. If you go out into some of the higher altitude dry lakes, like down in Death Valley, you got the, uh, the racetrack playa and a bunch of similar lake beds, you get these polygons. Now those hold water only a short time every year, but because they get it every year and they dry out completely and then it gets wet again, uh, you get these really well-developed polygonal mud cracks. So this is suggesting that water on Mars was not transient. It was probably there for a long time to cause these kinds of desiccation features. Very interesting. So I was up in Seattle on July 21st or so, which happened to be the same day that Taylor Swift filled Seattle's Lumen Field with over 70,000 people twice. I was not in Seattle for that. It should be noted, but I was trying to get to the train station, which is right next to the Taylor Swift concert, and it took me about a half an hour to get the four blocks I needed to go to get to the train station. <laughs> but anyway, that's neither here nor there. There's an on-site seismometer at the Lumen Field, which is the same stadium the Seahawks play at, and they use it during football games uh, just sort of as a fun tool for measuring crowd energy. Uh, there was a football player back in 2011 uh, I guess he was nicknamed the Beast, and every time he would score a touchdown, it registered on the seismometer because the crowd would go wild. But here, this is the Taylor Swift concert down here. This is the same vertical scale. Uh, and this is four minutes, so this is one song of the Taylor Swift concert, and it generated enough energy to register as a magnitude 2.3 earthquake on the on-site seismometer. So I guess that's what you get with uh, an enormous sound system and 70,000 people jumping up and down excitedly. Uh, but this is actually useful data and it's interesting uh, because it tells us how buildings, especially large buildings, respond to repeated heavy vibration. And it tells us a little bit about how the ground in that part of Seattle reacts to vibration. So this actually has a lot of implications for how we understand uh, sort of the geotechnical features and, and qualities of the ground where the stadiums are. So that's actually important work came out of the Taylor Swift concert. Any questions on that? No, that's fascinating. We did have one question that came up on the volcano that's erupting 500 times a day. How close do people live to something that, I'm, I'm assuming these are, are these ash eruptions or is it just? Yes. Yes, those are ash eruptions, not particularly large. Um, just sort of repeated throat clearing is how a lot of that is probably best described. Uh, people don't live terribly close to that one because it is, you know, it's a volcano that erupts a lot. Uh, so people don't live too close to it. It does occasionally impact uh, flight paths and drops ash on villages, but generally does not impact people too much, which is good. All right, last story I've got for this month. There was a paper that came out recently trying to understand how the, the rock that bears diamonds up to the surface, how does that behave as it rises through the crust? So I guess this is another magma ascent story, uh, but either way, diamonds form deep in the mantle, uh, underneath the crust, uh, where the chemistry is really bizarre. And because they're really hard, they are one of the few minerals that can survive being brought up from the upper mantle to the surface. Uh, this is a rock called kimberlite. It's a very ultramafic, ultrapotassic, uh, very uncommon magma composition. So it's got a lot of magnesium and it's got a lot of potassium uh, and a lot of carbon which is apparently really common in the upper mantle, but it's very rare. There's only a few dozen known kimberlite uh, outcrops in the world. 
Part of the work that this research produced determined the ascent rate of a kimberlite magma. And it's 11 to 83 miles an hour rising through the crust. Uh, and in places where the crust is 30 miles thick, which is not uncommon, especially where the kimberlites are found, maybe a little more than that, you could get magma going from the mantle to the surface to an eruption in less than an hour, which is amazing. That means you're getting highly explosive eruptions made of vaporized diamond ash, <laughs> which is really cool to, to sort of picture. Uh, but the thing that they were particularly interested in for this study was why are they happening where they do? These are really rare, so it has to be specific conditions that are conducive to these sorts of eruptions. And they determined that they coincide with the breakups of supercontinents like Pangaea or Rodinia, Gondwana land. So with the right combination of crustal thinning, uh, carbon dioxide content and magma rifting where the crust is thinning and mineral content can cause very explosive eruptions of kimberlite. Now this is usually happening sort of in the 20 to 30 million years after continents begin to break up. So as uh, say North America and Africa are just starting to pull apart, you'll get these big rift fractures going through the middle of continents. Uh, and that's where these kimberlite pipes are found. So interesting numerical and chemical work on these uh, kimberlite rocks. And that's all I've got for this month. Happy to take any questions. I said it in the chat, but I didn't want to take up too much of your time. But everybody should know that Taylor Swift is an honorary geologist. She was made an honorary geologist by the Washington VNR. Andrew, when were the last of these kimberlite eruptions then? Would it have been... It, uh, generally, the most recent ones are sort of in the, I, I want to say the sort of the 60 to 100 million year old range, but they do go back to the billions. Okay, Some of them are very old. During the break of a Pangaea? Pangaea or any of the older previous supercontinents of which there Virginia. were many. So, so where are the, the Kimberlites that erupted during the breakup of Pangaea, where are those? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In case anyone wanted to go. In the Queen's crown. Yes, okay, that's where they are. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, how long do we have you? I know that you're, you're going to be wrapping up your studies at PSU. How long do we have you doing the geology news? Well, it depends spot. if someone employs me soon or not. Okay. All right. Well, we've been, <laughs> I want to say this now, just how grateful we've been for your work over the past three years as we've seen this evolve, both as geology talk has evolved, but also as your work has evolved um, as a scientist. And for those of you may, I, I think it's recorded on the PSU website, but Andrew gave a marvelous talk um, on his master's thesis. And Andrew, your, your, your manner as a scientist and as a as a pedagogue, as a t as a professor, is wonderful. Uh, just modest and informative and clear, and so we've been very, very thankful to have you um, participating in the Geological Society over the past few years. So, thank you, Paul. Uh, I've enjoyed getting it. Getting that well. off my chest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, DNR is uh, Department of Natural Resources. So I guess Washington DNR, Gary is asking this question in the chat. I guess Washington DNR is the equivalent maybe of uh, our Department of Geology and Mineral Industries in Oregon, although I think Washington DNR has a has a broader jurisdiction um, as well. So, and I know that- I, uh, I, I, can, I can Dr. Speak Burnett, go. Since I used to work there. So. The, the, the Washington DNR would be the equivalent of Dogami plus the State Department of Forestry, plus uh, one or two other things. So it's it's a larger a larger entity than Dogami, but and and the geol what used to be called the Division of Geology and Earth Resources has ch officially changed its name to Washington State Geological Survey. Okay. but it's still a division. It is a division of DNR. I'm curious, do you think having all of those different kind of areas, uh, focus being in one department is a better way to do it or more efficient because people are kind of working together or is it 
there's too much for them to focus on. I'm not sure. <laughs> and and it, the equivalent is that the the Oregon Department of of Environmental Quality in Washington would be the the Department of Ecology and the Department of Water Resources. It's different, and they both have advantages and disadvantages. And the other thing I was going to add, I was going to type it in the chat, Kimberly, the type Kimberly area is South Africa. Yeah. Um, South Africa diamond mines, and there are Kimberlites in Arkansas, which is a, a, a failed continental rift up the middle of the of North America. All right. Emma. All right. I'll take it over. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Emma Raholsky. I um, just finished up my undergrad at Portland State University. Um, and as part of my undergrad, um, I decided to do a, a senior thesis, which is just a research project that I did over the course of my last year. This isn't required by any means by Portland State University, but I decided to um, do a thesis because I knew I wanted to go into research. And it's a really great way to kind of gain um, some experience and what it really is like to do research and kind of build your own research project. So overall, it was a really valuable experience for me doing a senior thesis. And if anybody has any questions, um, I know that there's somebody in our group today that is um, going to be going to PSU. But if anybody has questions about doing a senior thesis, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll drop my email in the chat at the end of this. Um, but yeah, my senior thesis focused on um, the stable isotopes of meteoric water within Oregon Caves National Monument. Um, and it was advised by um, Dr. John Bershaw, who's currently the chair of the geology department at PSU. He focuses on um, stable isotopes. He does a lot of paleoclimate research with stable isotopes, but he also does some other stable isotopes as kind of pro proxy for tracking water movement as well. So um, the Oregon Caves is a um, cave formed from the dissolution of a marble lens within the Klamath Mountains. The Klamath Mountains are in um, southwestern Oregon, and they were accreted terrain. And this marble lens was um, originally um, like a most likely like a coral reef that was off the um, the edge of uh, a, a volcano uh, or an, an island arc off in a tropical climate and then was transported up to um, the Oregon coast and then accreted on. And this marble lens is, uh, was metamorphosed from limestone into marble and then was then uh, dissolved by groundwater moving through it. So um, when you get dissolution happening like this, um, it tends to be um, a little bit messy. It doesn't necessarily happen evenly in every direction because of the composition of the marble being different in different places and also like structural things causing preferential pathways of dissolution. So because of that, um, it's very common for hydrology to be pretty um, complicated in these types of systems. And that is definitely the case at Oregon Caves National Monument. Um, generally, the cave hydrology is poorly understood. Um, dye tracing tests that have been conducted um, at Oregon Caves have sometimes come back inconclusive where they've put dye um, in a stream um, at a higher elevation than the cave that they would expect to see show up in the cave. And then um, not only do they not see the dye in the cave, but they also don't see the dye um, in streams at lower elevation from the cave. So they're not sure where that water is really going and um, also where the water in the cave is, is coming from for a lot of it. Um, this uh, image here is from a study done by Mary Schubert in 2007. She did um, a geochemical study of water within the Oregon Caves um, using major and minor trace elements as well as um, pH, um, conductivity, dissolved solids to kind of categorize discrete flow pathways within the Oregon Caves. And uh, she found some discrete pathways, but um, there were definitely sources for these pathways that she was unable to identify. So we have this one pathway here, which is, um, um, so yeah, we have uh, this one discrete pathway that we, we know about, um, Cave Creek um, enters into the cave here 
And then once it um, goes underground, it becomes bridge sticks. And then it flows through this area here, connects up with the rest of the water in the cave, which is generally flowing this way, um, and then exits here at the spring, um, and then turns back into Cave Creek. And um, this spring is located, um, essentially, if anybody's been to Oregon Caves, kind of at the visitor center where you first enter the cave. Um, and that's kind of like the lowest elevation site within the cave. Um, but there is uh, sources of water that go through the soil and also um, definitely streams that enter the cave, particularly this one that enters a shower and then goes through this room and meets up with Cave Creek, um, where we have not been able to successfully identify the surface water source. So to date, um, there has been little stable isotope research done on water within the Oregon Caves National Monument. Um, there have been stable isotope studies that have looked at speleothems, um, which are like stalactites and stalagmites and other formations within the cave. Um, and they look at the stable isotopes to essentially try to reconstruct paleoclimate, but um, not much has been done using stable isotopes to understand water currently moving within the cave. Um, and some broader impacts, this is a national monument, so we kind of decided that this is an important area to protect. There's nine endemic species within the cave and also a large bat population that's extensive, extensively studied and also is um, currently free of white nose syndrome. So they're really important to protect, protect and uh, they're very reliant on the water within the cave. And we need to have a clear understanding of where that water is coming from to effectively really protect those species in the future. So my main research question was, um, how do hydrogen and oxygen stable isotopes of water within Oregon caves compare to that of nearby surface water and precipitation? Um, in order to do this, I collected samples of surface water, precipitation, and cave water. So for the winter, which is kind of the time frame that I had to do this project, the caves are closed because the bat population utilizes the cave for hibernation. And if the bats are woken up in the middle of their hibernation, it expends too much energy and they most likely will not make it through the season. So they take it very seriously, not entering the cave unless it's very necessary. So I didn't go into the cave throughout the winter to sample. So that was kind of a limitation with my study, but I was able to go up there once a month and collect surface water and precipitation samples. And then I did one sampling campaign in April where I did surface water precipitation and also sampled drip water, which is water dripping from the ceiling off of usually speleothems. Um, and then drip pools, which are beneath those drips and then streams that are moving through the cave as well. Um, once I got all those samples, I sent them out to Iowa State University and um, to get the actual values for my data. Um, and then after I got that data back, I looked at the variations um, seasonally for surface water and precipitation and then compared those to what was going on within the cave. So here are my sampling sites. This is um, essentially the watershed constructed from my lowest elevation sampling site. Um, I know Sheila's familiar with Sucker Creek. This is Sucker Creek here. And I, my lowest elevation site for surface water um, was at the confluence of Grayback Creek and Sucker Creek. This middle stem here is Cave Creek. And that is the stream that goes into the cave and exits the cave. The cave is located at this black star here. And then additionally, I have a precipitation sampler located um, at this lower elevation site here. And I also got snow tail data from um, a higher elevation site up here. So for my sampling, I collected 26 samples of surface water, four precipitation samples, um, which represented three months of samples. I took two samples in one month. Um, and then two miscellaneous samples, which I didn't end up using, but I just thought would be interesting to see. Um, it would have been really cool to have gotten like a regular snow sample. I thought that my precipitation would represent that, but as I'll talk about later, it wasn't really very representative of what was going on with the snow because it was at such a low elevation. 
And then within the cave, I collected 17 samples, eight of which were streams. Some of those were collected from Cave Creek throughout the year or throughout the, the few months that I was sampling. Um, and then some of the other streams were within the cave at that one period in time. I got five drip samples and four drip pools. So during the sample um, campaign I have here, this is um, Ivan Yates and Sierra Himmel. They work at Oregon Caves currently and they were really awesome and just showing me around the cave and bringing me to sites that might be great for me to sample. Um, we ended up um, kind of walking up to this site, collecting water within the stream at the exit of the cave. And then also at the time it was still really snowy we uh, were trying to push back the, the sampling as late as we could, but it was April and there was still um, a couple feet of snow um, at the top of the, the cave. So we hiked through snow up to this uh, 101 exit, entered the cave in here and walked through, um, essentially followed this kind of path and sampled and then exited here. And this is a picture of me sampling. Uh, this is a drip pool. And I did take some measurements for conductivity and pH using this probe, but the uh, device was had a very short battery life. So I didn't get enough like consistent data to really use that. It would have been cool to see, but. Um, so before I talk about my results, I did want to go over just some basics for stable isotopes. I know people often hear about radiogenic isotopes, um, but stable isotopes kind of serve a different purpose in the world of science. So isotopes in general are um, an element, an atom that has um, it, it has a different number of neutrons. So the um, isotope for oxygen that we all know about on the periodic table is oxygen 16. It has eight neutrons and eight protons, but um, there are also um, isotopes of oxygen that have 10 neutrons. Um, almost, I think like 97% of oxygen is oxygen 16. So the majority of oxygen that we see is oxygen 16, but there is two to three percent of oxygen, um, that is oxygen 18. Um, and the same goes for hydrogen. We see hydrogen one with no neutrons on the periodic table, but there's also um, a species of hydrogen that has one neutron. So with stable isotopes, unlike radiogenic isotopes, which just decay over time, stable isotopes do not decay radioactively over time. So the only thing that affects the uh, portion of um, one isotope in a sample of water, per se, that we're talking about, would be um, the source that it came from, and then any processes that would have affected the proportions of those isotopes within the water. So pretty much with water, you get um, these proportions changing when you have phase change happening. So for example, if we have um, the ocean, a body of ocean water that has a proportion of oxygen 18 to 16, which sometimes we say is heavy to light, the 18 being the heavier, um, and we have a proportion of 18 to 16 that we know about. And then if that body of water experiences evaporation, the cloud um, of water that has been evaporated, um, it's going to have more oxygen 16 in it because it's more energetically favorable for the lighter isotope to take part in that, um, that process of evaporation. So the result is that the cloud has more lighter oxygen 16 in it, and the remaining body of water has more heavier oxygen 18 in it. And the same thing happens with hydrogen. Um, so we can essentially look at these delta values. A delta value essentially represents the proportion of heavy to light. We compare it to a reference so that we kind of all have the same values to work with across the world. Um, but these delta values, we can kind of look at and see what the source of the water was and kind of what has happened to that water since um, its origin um, from generally the ocean in, in the Pacific Northwest, usually it's the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then we also have, um, we can plot um, delta deuterium, which is hydrogen with 
um, one neutron, which has a mass of two. Um, and we can plot delta deuterium against delta 18O to get a, um, a plot called the global meteoric waterline plot that um, essentially when we compare those two values, we can get like a DXS value. So DXS is essentially a representation of the proportion of those different delta values for hydrogen and oxygen. So uh, this is kind of one of those plots here. You have hydrogen on the y-axis and oxygen on the x-axis. And we have this black line here, which is our global meteoric water line. It's a line with a slope of 8 and a y-intercept of 10. And that's generally just a global standard, which we can kind of compare the, the values for our data against to see if it's, this is you know lighter or heavier compared to this line. So D access is essentially the Y intercept of that line if it had a slope of eight. So these values being above this line, if there was a value or if there was a line going through it with a slope of eight, it would have a D access value that is higher than this line. So it's just kind of a fancy way of saying, is it plotting above or below this black line? Um, so this is my kind of the results from my study. This is all my data. Um, I pretty much just had one main plot, which is uh, this guy here. And uh, this second plot here is the same data, but I broke up surface water into two different groups. Um, and I also have numerical values here for anybody who is interested, but I'm gonna talk mostly qualitatively about kind of what I saw in my data. So the first thing that I noticed was that um, both cave water and surface water were consistently plotting above the global meteoric water line, meaning that it had a higher D excess value. Um, high D excess values is pretty characteristic of snow. So I interpreted this to be a function of snow playing a large role as inputs to surface water and um, cave water. Another thing that I saw was that the slope of my local meteoric water line, which is the just line generated from um, my surface water, um, had a relatively low slope. It's about six as compared to you know, what you would expect to be about eight. Um, sometimes low slopes can be uh, what we call an evaporation line. An evaporation line is what happens when a body of water evaporates. Um, when you have hydrogen and oxygen participating in evaporation, you're gonna get um, essentially the oxygen is going to fractionate more because it takes more energy to include like that heavier species of oxygen than it does the heavier species of hydrogen just because oxygen is so much heavier. So the difference in energy is greater. So when you get evaporation happening, you actually get more fractionation happening with the oxygen, causing the slope to kind of become lower and lower with more evaporation that's proceeding. So these values in these boxes are relative humidity. So essentially it's just representing like greater evaporation means like a lower slope. But generally with um, evaporation lines, they source at the global meteoric water line, which would be this line here, and then kind of branch off from it with a low slope. In our data, we uh, don't see that happening. It's not really branching off from the global meteoric water line. So uh, what I'm interpreting this to be is um, a variation in how much snow versus liquid water we're seeing. So the snow is kind of up we would expect it to plot kind of above the um, above the global meteoric water line, but we also have like a cluster of points here that have uh, are kind of grouped around the global meteoric water line, which you would expect to see more from liquid precipitation. So I'm thinking that some of these um, bodies of water had more of a snow input, and they're clustered down here, and then some had more liquid water, and they're clustering up here, which is causing that slope. So it's not an evaporation line. Another thing that I saw was that um, the isotopic signature for precipitation was pretty distinct from other samples. Most likely this is because my precipitation sample site was at a pretty low elevation. This is just because of limitations with my study. I wasn't able to get a sampler up at a higher elevation and know that I could consistently sample it. 
Um, and because it was in the National Monument, I didn't have permission at the time to get a sampler up there. So um, I had my sampler at this low elevation site and most likely what was going on was that there was um, more space between the ground and the cloud for evaporation to actually occur. And so that's kind of putting these points down below this uh, global New York water line. And I do have one point that's above, and that was from the month of April, where we had just a ton of snow come in, or I guess the month of March, because I collected it in April. But that represents a period in time where there was a lot of snow. So that kind of aligns with what I'm thinking, that things are plotting up here from um, snow being an input. You can also kind of see that with this plot which um, is just comparing delta 18 o values to snowpack. And uh, this here is the snowpack data from that snow tell site at that high elevation spot, just above the caves. And um, you can see that snowpack is kind of generally steadily increasing up through March into April. Um, and then uh, delta 18 values are kind of generally decreasing both for precipitation and surface water. Another thing that I noticed was that um, tributary streams, which um, when I broke up into groups were um, surface group two, this cluster of kind of red points up here, um, and trunk streams, which were these orange, kind of more dispersed points that have kind of more of a slope of around eight. Um, they have different isotopic signatures. Um, I interpreted this to be because of um, groundwater inputting into the trunk streams. So generally groundwater um, you see with isotopes having more of an average signal. So it looks more like an annual signal, which will generally look more like this global meteoric water line. Um, so I'm interpreting that uh, groundwater is contributing to the signals within these trunk streams, whereas these tributary streams, which are kind of at higher elevations, lower residence times, meaning the water's not in the streams for as long, um, kind of show more of a signal of recent precipitation events um, and they have shorter residence times. So they don't see that groundwater signal. And then finally, another thing that I noticed was that the isotopic signatures of waters within the cave were most similar to that of trunk streams. What is really interesting about this is that there are no trunk streams um, at a higher elevation site that could have fed into this cave. So what I'm interpreting this to be kind of a signal of is that um, there is significant groundwater input in the cave and it's more significant than um, uh, surface input from like, tri tributary streams. So overall, I kind of found that Snow had a very strong influence um, for the isotopic signatures of surface water and caves waters throughout the winter. And then the precipitation at our low elevation site was experiencing subcloud evaporation, meaning that, uh, you know, the signature is significantly different from what we might see at the high elevation site. And then additionally, that the stable isotopes of waters within the cave and for trunk streams suggests that there's a significant input of groundwater. So, you know, I'm not the only scientist that wishes that I had um, the ability to take more samples or have more time on this project, but I think that with stable isotope studies, they really greatly benefit from having like regular samples throughout multiple years. So really, in order to say anything definitively about what's going on in Oregon caves, um, a longer time scale study really needs to be done. I think the main outcome about this um, project, which I'm really excited about, is just to show that stable isotopes can be a valuable application to understanding the hydrology within um, caves and within Oregon caves as well, which is you know generally a little bit smaller of a cave. Um, so yeah, I think that that is kind of the main outcome is just proving that we can use stable isotopes for these applications. And they're also just a really um, affordable way to, to test water and you know you're gonna get data. Whereas with dye tracing tests with organ caves, you don't know if you're gonna see the dye. So, you know, you might have inconclusive results, but when you're sampling with um, and testing for stable isotopes, you know you're gonna get data that can be really valuable. Um, another thing that would have been really great is to just get 
um, stabilized tip data for precipitation at higher elevations just to see how it relates to the surface water and within the cave. And then just getting a more in-depth study of what the groundwater signature is of these isotopes. Um, I suspect that it will be similar to what we see within the cave and within trunk streams, but you really need to like have more of a concrete idea of what that annual average will be and what groundwater really looks like as far as the stable isotope signature. So yeah, that uh, that's everything. I have kind of a slide here with a bunch of pictures from my time as an undergrad at PSU. I just had a really valuable experience there. I did a lot of really cool field work and met a lot of great people, my mentors, and um, it's really changed the trajectory of my research and where I'm gonna go in the future and just had a really great time at PSU and um, loved my uh, my advisor for my thesis project and everything. So yeah, and then I have kind of a more boring slide with my references, but I'm gonna go back to the fun slide for questions. So. <laughs> oh, Emma, that was absolutely delightful. Thank you so much. We did end up with, before we get to my question, we did end up with several questions in the chat for you. Sure. Uh, Wes started out with, if the caves are eroded from a marble lens, how common is this in America, where I assume that most caves are eroded from limestone? Does that make Oregon caves unusual by comparison? Absolutely, it does. I mean, I think limestone caves are much more common. Marble caves are um, a little bit more rare. So yeah, I think that does make Oregon Caves really special and also just really beautiful when you see the difference in the texture of marble on the wall versus limestone. It's just, it's a really cool spot. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely a unique area because of the fact that it's eroded from and marble. I can add something to that too. Please. Okay, that's why I went down there when I was in school. I went down there and I gave, I spent the summer there giving lectures to the people uh, about the caves and how they're unusual. Because I read something online before I did that where people said, I don't know why the Oregon caves, what's so special about them? They're not as big as any of the other caves they've been in. And I thought, well, they're missing the whole point. The whole point is that these caves are marble and the reason they're marble is because of accreted terrain. So I gave lectures to the visitors about the accreted terrain and you know how terrains can get accreted and why why they're marble and that gave people a lot more appreciation for them mm -hmm. yeah i mean that is also why i just i love limestone and marble because these form in such warm climates and the fact that we have marble yes. limestone up here it just kind of shows the yes that's the other thing yeah it's you know, where are we getting limestone? <laughs> you know, you yeah, got to get that from a warm tropical sea. So what does that tell us about, you know, this stuff has traveled a long ways. Yeah. All right. So Lisa had a question. Uh, did you happen to catch any seawater samples during this adventure? Um, I did not sample any seawater Um I know my advisor, John Bershaw, has done some pretty significant studies of stable isotopes within just Oregon, the Pacific Northwest in general, and found that most of this water um, likely is sourcing from the Pacific Ocean. Um, we know what the stable isotope signature of the ocean, of the Pacific Ocean is. Um, that doesn't change on very fast timescales just because there's so much water. So uh, we didn't really need to sample the ocean water because we have those values already to compare to. All right. Well, I guess that was my question is whether you compared them. And I don't think I saw that in your graphs. No, I didn't compare <clears throat> the stable isotopes here to um, like the Pacific Ocean stable isotopes. I just kind of went off of... Um, my advisor, John Bershaw's data that this water is kind of sourcing from the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so moving on, next question. Uh, how can more accurate subsurface water maps contribute to water community water supply? And Gary went on to clarify, he was wondering about water supply management. 
And, uh, and that was his first question. He had a second question. If you detect a specific isotope concentration at a sampling point upstream, typically how far downstream in miles can that isotope be detected before subsequent water samples become too diluted to detect that isotope? Okay. I'll start with the first question. It's a big question, um, but understanding how water moves underground is very crucial to um, protecting this resource that we're really dependent on. Um, I believe I wrote a paper on this. It's been a while. I've kind of been checked out <laughs> this summer, but I believe the statistic is like 75% of people rely on groundwater for at least a part of their drinking water. And um, it, particularly in these kind of systems, which are called karst aquifers, um, they're characteristically known by having these large passageways and a lot of interconnection between how water flows. Like when you, if you ever have been to Oregon caves or seen pictures of a cave like this, it's almost like a full river moving through like an open passageway and then all these other like drips. So if you have one contaminant spill, like let's say a, a truck with oil spills off the side of the road and then leaks into that aquifer, um, knowing where that contamination is going to go within the aquifer so that you can um, very quickly respond uh, is crucial. And also just knowing what, who's drinking water that's going to contaminate. So that's very important. Um, and then the second question um, was about like how long that isotope stays as a tracer from upstream to downstream. And, um, you know, essentially it's different kind of than like other natural tracers where, you know, you're like looking at like concentrations of things relative to other things or can be diluted. It's more like broad than that, I guess, with stable isotopes. The isotope will always be there. So if you have like a certain water droplet with a certain stable isotope concentration, that water droplet will always be within your sample. And what you can tell is that, you know, generally within a watershed, you're going to have a pretty similar source. Like you're going to assume that the stable isotope composition of that cloud and that rainfall event is going to be pretty similar. Although recent work in stable isotopes, like my my um, colleague, Alyssa Stannard, who also did a senior thesis, she traced the stable isotopes throughout one precip precipitation event. And she did a couple events and it showed that there actually is some significant difference. But so far, stable isotope studies have kind of worked to like average the, the values for a precipitation event and just kind of make that assumption, which has proved to be a pretty okay assumption. But um, so you can kind of compare the values for stable isotopes for precipitation and then kind of trace that downstream. So it's, you're kind of looking at more average values as opposed to like looking at this one stable isotope composition. You're looking at kind of the broad and what that says about like how the water has behaved since sourcing from its, its main source. Okay, well, that makes sense. So uh, just Carrie, it's, had... noon, it's noon Pacific Standard Time, and I am militant about turning off the recording at noon so okay. that no one feels that they have to stay for longer than an hour. We want to respect everyone's time. However, I would like all the questions to be answered, and I know we have some people who have some real expertise on the caves here. So um, if Emma is willing to stay for the next half hour or the next period of time Absolutely. to answer those questions, um, again, thank you very much, Emma. I'll, I'll thank you again, but yeah. uh, let's turn off the recording, go to Q&A, and uh, Gary? Great, thank you.